Uh, thanks, Kish. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for that uh, very kind introduction and also uh, for giving me the opportunity to uh, uh, tell this audience a little bit about uh, what we're doing at the um, Center for uh, Tuberculosis Research here at UBC. So um, I'm sure as uh, many of you are aware, uh, TB is actually um, a very um, ancient disease. It was first reported um, by uh, Hippocrates, actually, um, uh, back then. It was referred to as uh, phthisis. Um, it was the most widespread disease of the time, and it was uh, almost always fatal. Um, of course, uh, we now can go back into prehistorical times, and um, the um, evidence from uh, mummified Egyptians, for example, uh, has revealed evidence of uh, tubercular decay uh, found in the spines of these individuals. Uh, but even going further back than that, um, there's been evidence of uh, tuberculosis uh, uh, discovered in uh, prehistoric remains dating from uh, 7000 BC. Uh, so it really is a, a very uh, old disease. And now, as we're getting molecular evidence, uh, it's clear that uh, Mycobacter Mycobacterium tuberculosis, the bacterium that causes the disease, is as old as humans uh, themselves. And um, actually, uh, it appears that, um, so um, a, a long-standing hypothesis or theory was that um, we got um, TB from herding animals when we started to um, uh, domesticate them, if you will, um, but actually it appears that um, the inverse actually happened. We gave TB to cattle. Okay, so, um, more recently, um, TB has continued to be um, a major killer. Um, it uh, has been gone, it's gone under various names over the ages, including consumption and the white plague. Um, in uh, Britain, at the beginning of the 19th century, it was still killing one in four people, so really huge numbers. And, um, uh, took down um, a lot of uh, very notable figures as well. Um, it, rather curiously, at around this time, uh, TB was associated with uh, genius and creativity. Um, quite an amazing um, thing when you think about it. Um, but um, with the turn of the uh, 20th century in particular, um, TB rates began to decline. Uh, largely due to uh, improvements in living conditions, well, initially anyways, um, so less, less crowding um, and uh, improved sanitation. Uh, so um, this is, these are some data taken from um, mortality rates in England and Wales, but they're very representative of what was happening elsewhere in the industrialized world. Uh, TB rates, uh, then um, their decline were uh, decline in death rates was helped by the development of uh, vaccine uh, back in 1924. Uh, so this is the, the BCG. Uh, and then, of course, um, even more dramatically with the development of uh, antibiotics. So uh, the first that was developed was streptomycin uh, back in 1944. But uh, rates declined uh, so much, uh, not only um, in um, that, that is death rates due to TB declined so much, uh, um, that um, the U.S. Surgeon General was prompted to uh, state um, back in 1969 that it was time to close the book on infectious diseases. So this was uh, largely uh, due to the uh, advent of uh, antibiotics. I should point out that uh, while um, drug-sensitive uh, TB can be treated uh, fairly effectively, um, the chemotherapy is still uh, rather brutal. So it involves uh, six months of treatment uh, during the first two months, uh, patients are actually uh, treated with a cocktail of uh, four different uh, antibiotics. Uh, and then this is followed up with a further four months of treatment with, uh, the, first, uh, with the two first-line antibiotics, really. And these are isoniazid and uh, rifampicin. Um, <clears throat> so the other thing I'll just point out to you, uh, since we've got this timeline here, is that um, this arrow here uh, points to the date of 1963, and that corresponds to uh, the date when uh, the last uh, TB drug was developed, uh, rifampicin. And since then, uh, partly due to the statement 
by the U.S. Surgeon General, no new antibiotics uh, for the treatment of TB have been developed. And you can contrast that, um, so since we're talking about neglected diseases, um, to uh, the number of drugs uh, that have been developed uh, or that have made it to market since 1980 for the treatment of AIDS. And uh, 30 drugs have been developed. So really huge discrepancy. So um, given, this, uh, given these developments though, and our success in, uh, in, in treating uh, drug-sensitive TB, um, you might be rather astounded by the fact that um, this bacterium is still the most devastating infectious uh, agent of mortality worldwide. So in particular, um, it infects uh, fully one-third of the world's population. Uh, it's estimated that a, um, there's a newly infected individual worldwide every second and it kills, continues to kill, just under two million people each year. So uh, a pro that corresponds to uh, one person dying every 15 seconds or so, or probably about 50 people have died of TB uh, in the world since I've begun speaking to you this morning. So why is this? And basically it's for two main reasons. Uh, the first is due to co-infection with HIV, okay? so. Uh, TB, uh, like HIV, attacks the immune system. That is the very uh, system that uh, we've evolved to um, take out uh, foreign invaders. Um, and in fact, it's the, uh, the major cause of death. Uh, it is a major cause of death of people living with HIV AIDS. Um, so um, uh, this burden of co-infection uh, between HIV and TB, since they're both uh, attacking the immune system, um, um, they, they work uh, almost synergistically, if you like, uh, to devastating effect, and uh, this effect is, is most apparent in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, and is of growing concern in Asia as well. The second major reason why TB continues to be uh, such a force to be reckoned with is due to the emergence of drug resistance. And in fact, there's been a number of uh, particular terms developed uh, for various strains. Uh, the first is MDR-TB, which uh, is uh, multi-drug-resistant uh, TB, and these are strains that are resistant to both uh, first-line drugs that I mentioned to you, isoniazid and rifampicin. And uh, more alarmingly, perhaps, is the rise in XDR-TB. So this is uh, extensively drug-resistant strains. Um, and these are essentially uh, MDR-TB strains that have, in addition, acquired resistance to uh, uh, fluoroquinolones and um, at least one other second-line drug, such as canamycin. Okay, and again, I remind you that no new uh, anti-TB drugs have been developed um, for almost 50 years now. Okay. Uh, just to tell you a little bit more about um, XDR-TB, um, perhaps one of the most uh, dramatic stories um, concerning this train um, was uh, reported in uh, South Africa, so a uh, small village in um, uh, uh, KwaZulu-Natal. And um, a, um, the hospital in this village, um, so the Church of Scotland Hospital, uh, reported in 2000, they identified um, 53 uh, patients um, as having uh, XDR-TB. Within, uh, in, in the end, 52 of these 53 patients died, um, including those who were on antiretroviral uh, therapy, and the medium survival of these patients from uh, the collection of their uh, sp uh, sputum specimens to death was 16 days. So it was really, um, XDR-TB is really uh, very difficult uh, to fight. Um, XDR-TB is not confined to uh, South Africa or indeed Africa. It is a global problem. So cases have been reported on every continent now, include, and in most countries, including, uh, including Canada. In fact, uh, Canada um, also has a TB problem. Uh, it's been in the news twice recently here. 
Um, so in uh, mid-February, uh, the CBC uh, reported uh, a study um, in, published in the Canadian Medical Journal uh, of our failure to fight or of uh, increasing rates of TB in, the, uh, in Nunavut. So it's the uh, First Nations people of this country who are most um, affected by TB. And um, <clears throat> the respirologist involved in the study uh, uh, pointed out quite rightly that the fact that we have failed uh, to deal with the problem in none of it, uh, not just once, but over a century, uh, should be an embarrassment to every Canadian. Uh, the problem in TB in Canada is not just confined to First Nations people, though. Uh, there's also, so in this article uh, that appeared in The Sun, again, uh, just a few weeks, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, um, this is the Toronto Sun, uh, they were reporting the uh, death rate from tuberculosis amongst homeless people in Toronto. Uh, and uh, it, they were pointing out that one in five homeless people with tuberculosis die within a year of their diagnosis. The, um, um, a person doing this study pointed out that if uh, multi-drug resistant strains uh, were to appear in this population, then the outbreak would be extremely difficult to control. OK, so uh, hopefully I've, I've convinced you um, that the, uh, uh, the need for new drugs to treat TB um, is very high, uh, urgently required. And in particular, um, and to be fair, there are um, a number of um, drugs that are in the pipeline, uh, various uh, um, clinical trials. Um, these drugs, just to um, sharpen the focus a little bit, um, are required um, specifically uh, to shorten the treatment, shorten our current treatment regime. So remember, I was telling you, even for drug-sensitive strains, um, treatment requires six months. Uh, we need to be able to treat uh, multi-drug and extensively drug-resistant strains. And um, we'd also like to provide more effective treatment for um, latent TB infection. Um, okay, so before I tell you a little bit about what we're doing to combat this problem uh, at the CD CTBR here at UBC, I'll just walk you through a little bit more about um, the bacterium that causes the disease and um, the, the uh, pathogenesis of it as well. Okay, so um, TB is caused by this um, rod-shaped uh, bacterium, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, uh, when it infects you, it, it infects you through inhalation. Uh, when you inhale it, um, the um, bacterium is phagocytosed by um, macrophages in your lungs, so alveolar macrophages. Um, macrophages are designed to uh, essentially digest, uh, break down uh, foreign invaders uh, such as bacteria. And the interesting um, thing about MTB is that when it is um, ingested by uh, the macrophage and enters the phagosome, it then manipulates the host. It manipulates the macrophage, uh, preventing its digestion in this phagosome. So it actually tricks the host and makes a little niche for itself in which it can um, survive and indeed replicate. So uh, once it's infected a macrophage, it induces a, a pro-inflammatory response. And this leads to the generation of these characteristic granulomas in the lung tissue. Um, so these granulomas um, 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 essentially are these, uh, um, uh, these, these assemblies of uh, infected macrophages with necrotic tissue in the middle of them. And they're walled off uh, from the body uh, by a uh, by a, a fibrous cuff. And the bacterium then can then survive, or the, or the disease can then exist in this state um, for decades uh, until there is a, uh, oh, before I get into that, um, I've got the shot of a, uh, of a granuloma here. So you can see the, the fibrous cuff with the necrotic uh, liquefied material in the middle uh, surrounded by infected foamy macrophages. Um, and then at some point, uh, when there's a uh, weakening of the immune system, uh, the granuloma, and this can take years before it happens, um, the granuloma caseates, um, the uh, fibrous cuff dissolves, and the bacteria are liberated into the uh, alveoli. And then we've got this uh, cough, 
and um, the, the cycle can repeat again. So this is a, a cross section of, an, of a, a highly infected uh, lung. So this would be a secondary infection. And you can see the uh, granulomas here. And you can also see this uh, cavitation in the lung tissue that's very characteristic of, um, of the disease. And this is due to this, uh, this caseation. OK, um, so here at the uh, uh, Center for TB Research, uh, we are targeting a number of different uh, systems within the bacterium uh, to try and develop, uh, amongst other things, uh, novel uh, therapeutic strategies. Uh, so some of these involve, uh, um, some of the systems that we're targeting uh, involve uh, cholesterol uh, degrading enzymes um, that um, the bacterium uses as a, as a source of energy. Um, particular um, signaling proteins um, that the bacterium uses to, to trick and to manipulate its host in order to survive. And then um, systems that the bacterium uses um, to uh, increase its, its resistance um, and um, <coughs> increase its, um, its virulence. Um, so I can't tell you about all the things that we're working on, but I'll tell you a little bit about each of these three major projects that are ongoing. Okay, so um, about uh, five years ago or so, uh, myself and my uh, colleague, Bill Moan here uh, at UBC, uh, working in collaboration with some folks in the Netherlands, uh, discovered um, a cholesterol catabolic pathway in mycobacterium tuberculosis. The entire pathway is encoded by about 80 genes. So this is a, a, a fairly significant portion of the genome of the bacterium is dedicated to breaking down cholesterol. Uh, through um, bioinformatics studies, we were able to piece together uh, the pathway. And uh, we're currently um, demonstrating the function of all these different enzymes in the pathway. Um, What's, we're still not entirely sure what the role of cholesterol degradation is in this uh, disease, uh, but I can tell you that uh, when the bacterium infects uh, the macrophage, uh, cholesterol is delivered to the phagosome in, these, uh, in the form of these lipid droplets. And also this uh, granuloma that I showed you, uh, this necrotic uh, liquefied material in the middle of the granuloma is about 50% cholesterol. Okay, so. Uh, cholesterol, at the very least, is a very important uh, source of uh, energy and uh, food for the bacterium during infection. So in order to uh, validate um, these um, different uh, genes of the pathway as um, uh, targets for novel therapeutics, we uh, knock them out. So here's an example. Uh, we knock out one of the, uh, in which one of the uh, cholesterol degrading genes is knocked out. And you can see that um, uh, wild type MTB used, typically kills skid mice. These are immu immunocompromised mice um, after uh, 25 days or so. And when you knock out this cholesterol degrading enzyme, uh, the mice survive. Uh, similarly, um, when you knock out this gene, um, the um, immunocompetent mice will clear the mutant bacterium. Okay, so this establishes that uh, this particular gene enzyme is essential for virulence. Uh, so in collaboration with uh, Natalie Stranadka, we're getting uh, highly detailed information on the structure of these enzymes, also uh, studying um, how they work. Uh, and of course, uh, another very important part of our work is to uh, try and develop inhibitors for these enzymes as potential novel therapeutics, as lead compounds. And we're doing this work uh, in collaboration with the CDRD, so screening um, uh, libraries of uh, small molecules, and uh, just last week we were um, able to identify uh, a number of uh, compounds uh, with IC50s um, in the high nanomolar range. So uh, this work is obviously ongoing. Uh, second uh, thing that we're working on in the uh, CTBR is um, these um, particular uh, proteins that the bacterium has to try and manipulate the host. Uh, one of these proteins is a um, protein tyrosine phosphatase, PTPA. This is work being done by Yossi Avge's lab. And you can see, again, when you knock out uh, this gene, PTPA, uh, macrophages are able to, uh, or the, this mutant is no longer able to survive in macrophages. Okay, and he's shown, uh, Yossi's shown, that uh, this um, um, enzyme is secreted by the bacterium 
and it actually binds to uh, a particular host protein that's involved in vacuole um, um, trafficking. And again, uh, Yossi has um, identified some inhibitors of uh, this tyrosine phosphatase um, that have um, KICs in the low micromolar range. Okay. Perhaps, um, so, and the third uh, project um, that I'll just tell you um, a little bit about is perhaps uh, the most exciting. Um, and th this involves attempts um, by uh, Charles Thompson and co-workers to overcome the high intrinsic resistance of MTB to antibiotics. So um, as I've mentioned already, uh, MTB does have a high intrinsic resistance to many uh, conventional antibiotics. They have absolutely no effect on them. But it turns out that um, the bacterium has um, or, or regulates this, this resistance and uh, a, a, by a similar system that it uses to regulate its, its virulence as well. So if you can develop um, a compound that inhibits that intrinsic resistance, then the bacterium should become susceptible to conventional antibiotics. Um, so based on this hypothesis, uh, Charles has been uh, screening for um, compounds that act synergistically uh, to take out the bacterium. Okay? So basically uh, what he's been doing is uh, screening for um, compounds that will make the bacterium sensitive to an antibiotic to which it's not normally sensitive. So in this case, uh, it's uh, uh, spectinomycin. And you can see here that in the presence of certain compounds, um, the bacterium is killed. That's what these uh, clearing zones represent here. Okay? And then he can, uh, um, they are further um, honing this uh, screening strategy so that they can identify um, compounds that act together synergistically so that their combined effect is greater than the sum of their individual contributions, okay? And uh, using this approach, he's actually been able to identify a number of compounds that act synergistically. And um, what's interesting is that in his, uh, what's, what's particularly um, promising ab about this approach is that um, in his initial, in their initial screens, they uh, used drugs um, that, or antibiotics that have already been clinically approved. So essentially, uh, this results in huge savings in time and expense in getting these compounds uh, to um, use in the clinic. And in fact, um, Charles and his collaborators here are currently in talks with researchers at Stellenbosch uh, in order to uh, test these, uh, uh, that's in South Africa, um, to test these various combinations that they've identified here at UBC. Okay, so um, that's um, an overview of some of the stuff that we're doing uh, at the CTPR. The CTPR um, is, uh, comprises uh, 12 researchers uh, located uh, here in the LSI um, at other places uh, across campus including the, uh, and at the VGH, as well as a, a number of researchers at the uh, BCCDC. I'd like to acknowledge uh, funding from the uh, Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research uh, for uh, getting the uh, center off the ground as well as uh, CIHR that's funding a lot of our research and of course the contributions of the CDRD and NGDI. So thank you very much. <laughs>